Uh, the theme for this year of this year's event is empowering patients, enhancing care, delivering for our communities. And you'll be hearing from a range of expert speakers from across the trust. Our exec team are also hand to reflect on the highlights and challenges of the year, and we'll be presenting our annual plans and annual plan. Um, a warm welcome to uh, members of our board, Alex, our chief exec, and executive members of the board, as as well as non-executive members of the board as well. And also, uh, I'm delighted to see so many of our governors on the, at the AGM tonight as well. And I'd like to formally welcome, I'm not absolutely sure, but I, I'd like to welcome Maria Miller, MP for Basingstoke, and Steve Bright, for MP for Wichester and Charles Ford, who are joining us this evening. Uh, in terms of the agenda, we will give you a review, the normal rundown for our AGMs, we'll give you a review of the year that will look at the many component parts of delivery through the past year, including our finances and our performance. We'll then have a uh, an opportunity for questions at the end of that section. Then we'll be hearing from our lead governor, Dawn Taylor, and then from Louise Fox, uh, who's talking about um, nursing at HHFT, Stephen Kidd, who's talking about microbiology and pathology, and Sam Jackson and Becky Housley, who were talking about our virtual health club, all of which I hope will go to show the amazing amount of work that our people do in the organisation. In terms of questions, you should be able to see at the top of your screens a Q&A button. If you want to ask a question, then feel free to uh, swatch that button and you'll be able to type in any question that you like. As I said, we'll take questions at the end of the uh, work annual report and then we'll have individual question sessions at the end of each of the presentations. Um, before I hand over to Alex for a review of the year, I just wanted to say one thing and it was to pay tribute to our amazing people in this organisation. It's been another very, very pressured year for the NHS. You'll all be aware of that. You can all see what's going on uh, within the healthcare provision across the country. And our staff have been absolutely magnificent. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to pay tribute to their commitment, their compassion, and the way that they deliver care to our patients. Um, I've said this many, many times before, but it's an honour to work with our, our staff and the way that they work for our patients. Uh, and I really mean that from the heart. And, and I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you to them for the brilliant job that they do. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand you all over to Alex, who's gonna take us through the highlights of last year and the annual report, Alex. Thank you very much, Steve, thank you. So yes, so this um, hand, annual report relates to the year that ended at the end of March, 2023. So um, it may feel a little bit historic for people, but it's important that we reflect back on that year. And then I have tried to do a little bit of bringing things slightly up to date as well. So if we start with, if we get to the next slide, Tom. We start with the principles that guide us. Thank you. So our five values around being compassionate, accountable, respectful, encouraging and inclusive. So our care values have been with us for a long time now. And in the year that's just gone, we reviewed them and we added inclusivity as a wraparound to recognise the huge diversity that we have in our workforce, but also the diversity we've got in our population that we care for. And it's been really exciting to have that as an additional wraparound value um, in terms of the way we work here at Hampshire Hospitals. We start with the people we care for. So we care for around 600,000 people who live in this area across Hampshire. Um, we obviously have our hospitals at Andover, Basingstoke and Winchester, but we're also providing care to people in GP surgeries, in Alton Community Hospital, Eastleigh Health Centre and a whole range of community settings, including in people's homes a lot of the time. And you're going to hear a bit more about virtual health later on. And who are we? Well, we are our people. We are around 9,000 colleagues um, covering 30 medical and surgical specialties. You can see some of the breakdown here. We've got over 2,000 nursing, midwifery and health visiting staff. Um, and you're going to hear a bit more about some of the nursing uh, programmes and achievements from Louise in a minute. Um, we have nearly a thousand doctors now um, of all different grades, junior doctors, doctors in training and senior consultant doctors. 
We have over a thousand healthcare assistants who support um, the frontline care. We have healthcare scientists, and you're going to hear from one of those later as well. Um, scientific, therapeutic and technical, that's our allied health professionals. Our administration staff, estate staff, cleaners, porters, catering staff. And of course, the amazing volunteers who support us. So we all work together in partnership with our vision of providing outstanding care for every patient. And it is wonderful the NHS has been doing that for 75 years. Our Council of Governors, many of whom are here tonight, and I can see Dawn on my screen as our lead governor, and you're going to hear from her later. They are volunteers as well, and they work alongside the board of directors to ensure that the local community and our staff have influence um, over how our services are developed. We're really lucky with the governors we have who recognize who represent a huge range of um, professional backgrounds, um, of geographical backgrounds, and bring the voice of our patients to our decisions. We have our members, many of you, oh, sorry, Tom, you go back, members, many of whom um, are here on this call um, and come from Hampshire, but also further afield. And this triangle shows you our strategy. So we, we wrote our strategy in 2022. We refreshed it with our vision to provide outstanding care for every patient, for all our patients, underpinned by our values and with our five strategic themes. And as I reflect on the year 22-23, I'm going to pick up each of those themes um, in turn and tell you a little bit about what we've been doing to help us deliver those strategic themes. Steve reflected on a challenging year and it was a very challenging year. It was a very busy year um, and you can see some of the numbers here. It, it always amazes me, Six, 600,000 outpatient appointments um, that we had to organise, administer, book and then clinician seeing patients. Just a phenomenal number of interactions with our population. Over 8 million pathology tests, uh, babies, nearly 5,000 babies born either in our hospitals or at home, um, and all the other numbers you can see there, including over 3,000 WOW nominations, which is our, our scheme where the public, patients and colleagues can nominate another colleague for something really special that they've done. So starting with our first strategic theme, our first theme is providing outstanding care for every patient. And that is our top priority. It is the thing we think about every day. It's it's the thing that we focus on. Ooh, I've got a bit of an echo there. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, and um, there's, I could have filled hundreds of slides. I've got a couple of slides here of the things we've done to help improve the care we provide. Um, one of the big capital projects last year was the Hampshire Heart Centre on our Basing Soak site. That has two cardiac cath labs. They are facilities where we can um, uh, cure people's heart attacks almost immediately. So there's a there's a procedure which has to happen very quickly if somebody's having a heart attack to open up um, the vessels in the heart. It happens 24 seven. The ambulance brings you straight to the new heart center and the procedure happens uh, kind of almost immediately, it's life saving. But they also do lots of planned work. And by having two of these units next to each other, we're able to do the planned, more considered um, work alongside the emergency work. In terms of cancer, there's been a real focus on this faster diagnosis standard. What that standard is, is about telling a patient either you have or you haven't got cancer within 28 days of a GP first referring to the hospital saying, I, I think this person may have cancer. And we're in the top 20 percent nationally of telling people within 28 days, yes, you have or no, you haven't. Um, we opened a new surgical assessment unit in Winchester. We get wonderful patient feedback about that. A really um, beautiful way of looking after patients in a way that means they don't have to be admitted to hospital. They can come in, they can have some investigations, they can um, meet with professionals, they can do all sorts of things and they can go home. And if they need to come back the next day, they can do that. If they do need to be admitted, of course, they are admitted. And we've been working really hard with partners around flow. Now, that's, that sounds a bit jargony, but effectively making sure that people get into hospital really quickly if an ambulance brings them, but also get home again really quickly when they're well enough to do that. And what do our patients say? Well, we have a thing called the friends and family test, and I'm sure many of you know about this. 
and we ask our patients about the quality of care that they receive. And there are four different um, friends and family um, services, if you like. There is ED, that is the emergency department. Uh, you may know it as A&E. Um, there is inpatient, so people who've had a stay in hospital overnight or for several nights. There is outpatients, people who come in just for a, an appointment and then go home again. And there are our maternity services. And what you can see here is that of the 55,000 people who submitted a friends and family result in the, la in the last year, um, these are the results. And in all four of those areas, our patients at Hampshire Hospital scored the care more positively than the national position. That is amazing and is testament to the wonderful staff that we have across all these departments. Now, of course, we're not resting on our laurels. We want it to be 100 percent, not just 96 percent. Um, but even so, I think it is tremendous that given all the pressures we were suffering, our staff have continued to focus on the patients and the care that they need. So that's our first objective. Our second objective is around making Hampshire hospitals a great place to work for our people, for all of our people. And we made some really good progress in the year 22-23. I'm going to go to the slight bottom of this slide first because the thing that I still think is amazing is that we achieve full recruitment for our registered nurses and our midwives. There are plenty of trusts across the country who would be very, very jealous of that position. Um, so how did we do that? Well, really concerted effort between our nursing colleagues, our midwifery colleagues and our HR colleagues to recruit and retain and particularly recruitment from um, overseas and ensuring that that international recruitment is successful, supportive and our colleagues who come from from all over the world, come and look after the people of Hampshire can feel at home here in Hampshire, feel welcomed and supported. So in total, we attracted 25,000 candidates um, through our recruitment processes. And in terms of our staff survey, now I don't want, I don't want to, I definitely don't want to sound too complacent here. This is not where I want it to be. So I want everyone who works at Hampshire Hospitals to love working at Hampshire Hospitals, and we are not there yet. But we are making some progress. And you can see some of the data here, I think particularly important that. 88% of people who work for us feel that their role makes a difference to patients. We come to work for our patients. Um, so we're still working on this. We had a better score this year than last year, and we want um, the year that's ahead to be even better still. The next slide has a few of the things we've done to try and help with the staff wellbeing um, and make sure that everybody really does feel valued and empowered with us. Um, the I talked about colleagues coming from all over the world. Um, one of the things we've been working on really hard is ensuring that our senior leadership um, cohort cadre is representative of the rest of our co um, colleagues. Um, and we're not there yet. So if I look back two or three years, um, we had around 10 percent of people in the band seven and above. Now, I know, again, more NHS jargon. Band seven is sort of senior management um, and above who were from an ethnic minority, um, around 10%. We've got that up to 13.5%. Our total population of people who work for us is currently over 25%. So we have not reached equity yet. We are not there. But we have gone from 10 to 13 and, and beyond, and we are moving in the right direction. We had over 400 nominations for our staff awards, our um, people awards, which was brilliant, a fantastic evening where we celebrated um, our colleagues. Um, we got good in our first Ofsted inspection for apprenticeships, and we're very proud of our apprenticeship programme. It, it works at all sorts of levels. We have apprentice nurses and radiographers. We have apprentices in our facilities teams, in our administration teams, and in a whole range of areas. But one of the things that I think is particularly special is our supported apprenticeships for people with learning disabilities, learning difficulties, autism, people who may not otherwise be able to access an apprenticeship programme elsewhere. feels really important that as a big employer, we are offering opportunities to people who maybe might not get opportunities with other employers. So really fantastic, that apprenticeship programme. Volunteers that we couldn't do things without. Our volunteers are amazing. And we are so grateful for them. Um, and we have a really comprehensive equality, diversity and inclusion action plan, um, which we've been progressing some elements of and there's more to do in the year ahead. 
I wanted to talk about freedom to speak up because this is a really important part of creating a culture where everybody is able to say how they think, how they feel and what life is like for them. Um, and there is a national system, the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians, and we are really lucky. And I think I saw a couple of our guardians, Steph and Helen, and there may be others who are on this call this evening, um, who have done extra training in order to support their colleagues if they want to uh, raise any concerns, raise any issues. And last year, in the year 22-23, um, 90 different people went to these guardians. So they are well known, um, well respected, and people feel safe and confident talking to them. And you can see the breakdown of some of the issues there around um, it was set up predominantly for patient safety, but in reality, patient safety doesn't tend to be the largest um, cohort. It tends to be around behavioural relationships or bullying or concerns about employment terms. And it's a really safe space for people to come forward. And I just wanted to give you three examples to bring some flavour of this. We had a, a, a colleague who was looking to adopt her um, nephew who had been orphaned in Africa and realised that our kinship adoption pol or policy, our adoption policy didn't cover kinship adoption. So if you were related to the child you were trying to adopt um, and so she wasn't entitled to the same leave as she would have been if she'd been going through a, an adoption process a, in the UK. And, and she went to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardians because uh, kind of the, the first response was well, the policy is the policy and they were able to support her and we got the policy we changed the policy we discovered that the national policy for agenda for change doesn't cover kinship adoption so we I think are one of the first trusts in the country to include that she was able to benefit in adopting her orphaned nephew but actually other people will benefit as well so brilliant use of the freedom to speak up guardians We've also had people raise issues about um, whether a band two and a band three job, these are um, lower bands in our system, but healthcare assistants are often either band two or band three, and what, how they are decided upon, and is it equitable? And if I'm a band three healthcare assistant, or, and this person's a band two, are we actually doing the same job? And we've been able to do a really good piece of work to understand the differences between band two and band three. And then we had one which was about how we handle chemicals in theatres and somebody who'd arrived at the trust relatively recently saying, well, I think where I came from before, there were some more stringent processes and procedures. And that was, again, was brilliant. We were able to go in and look at it, make the changes and say a massive thank you to the person who raised that. So many different issues, but really, really important that we have that available to all of our colleagues. Next slide. So our third objective is around working together for our population. So this was the new objective that we added in 2022 about our responsibility beyond the walls of the hospital for the whole population we serve. And we've collaborated with our community, with our partners, with our patients to introduce a number of services and to, to really uh, try and get away from the, the barriers between organisations when people access health and care. Andover Community Diagnostic Centre is a brilliant example. We received capital funding to be able to expand the services in Andover to increase access to X-ray, CT, ultrasound, MRI, endoscopy, a whole load of diagnostic facilities that, are, that we've got much more availability of now in Andover than we had before. Virtual Health Hub, I'm not going to steal the thunder for later on. You're going to hear all about that. That was an that is an amazing partnership project. And Call Before Convey fits within that of working with the ambulance service to give them a route to get advice from the hospital um, before they convey a patient who maybe doesn't actually need to come here. The next um, objective is making the best use of our resources. And this is where we use our um, uh, statutory requirement to share our annual accounts with you at this meeting. Um, and I'm going to ask Steve West, our chief finance officer, to just talk to this slide um, as our um, financial controller effectively for the organisation. Steve, are you all right to come in and talk about resources? Yeah, happy to, Alex. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So, I mean, financially, it's been a very, very difficult year for the trust. Um, as you can see on the slide, a £27.7 million deficit. That's the biggest deficit we've ever had, 4.6% of income. You know, you can sort of see in the bottom right-hand corner the causes for it, you know, i.e. costs rising faster than income. And actually, if you uh, take out the impact of inflation, income reduced uh, in real terms last year for the trust. And that was largely, you know, as we came out of COVID or supposedly came out of COVID, because we actually had more COVID last year than we had in the previous years, um, income was reduced, 
um, as the government sought to reset the, the position to a, a more normalised, what they saw more normalised pre-COVID level. But we still had all the same pressures. And, you know, we found ourselves in a position where we had um, we had to launch a, a full scale financial recovery programme. We were working on that for the majority of last year. It's been an awful lot of management effort put into that. But nevertheless, we still had a significant deficit. We'll probably have a significant deficit this year also. This is a two or three year journey. I think we're not. This is this is this is a common issue across the NHS. Um, so it's been very challenging financially, um, but we have been working on it. I think actually our position this year relative to others will be much better than it was last year. And I think we will hopefully be one of the first to emerge from this um, this situation. Um, you can see we spent a lot of money on our capital, 35.5 million pounds. It sounds like an awful lot of money. Um, and you've seen some examples in previous slides um, and things that Alex has talked about around some of the things that we've done with that. However, the underlying condition of our estate um, continues to get worse. It's not enough money to keep what we've got going. And that's why the new hospital programme is absolutely necessary for our trust. And we are really excited about that. Um, cash, as you can see, 27.7 million pounds. Um, that's a deterioration from the previous year, probably not surprisingly, given our deficit. Um, previously, it was around just under 64 million, so around about a 36 million reduction year on year. Thank you, Steve. That's great. And if there are questions on finance, as, as Steve Erskine said, do put them in the Q&A and then we'll pull all the questions through at the end of this section. Thank you. Um, the next slide stays a little bit on the money theme. This is about our charity. So we relaunched our Hos Hampshire Hospitals charity last year and we recruited some people to help us um, raise funds and to publicise the amazing work that the charity does. And I am um, delighted to say that we raised um, nearly a million pounds in the year. Um, that is from our community, from our, our, our patients, our friends, our partners, all sorts of things, local businesses. And that money goes to support a whole wide range of, of things such as patient welfare, staff break rooms, um, some medical equipment, some um, refurbishment of rest areas, some support for training, for research. There's a whole range of different things that money goes to. So just a huge thank you to everybody who, who donated last year. Um, and then our fifth objective is around innovation for a sustainable future. Um, and I think Hampshire Hospitals has some amazing innovators and you're about to hear from some of them um, following this bit. Um, but it's been really important that we focus on a sustainable future from both an environmental perspective, but also a clinical perspective, a financial perspective perspective and in all other ways. We need the hospitals to be here for generations to come and we need to do things in a way that's sustainable. In terms of our green plan, we launched that at the beginning of last um, financial year in support of the NHS's net zero plan. And we've done some brilliant work because we have people scattered throughout the trust who have a real passion for this. And I would particularly call out people in anaesthetics who've done a great job on anaesthetic gases that have an environmental impact. People in facilities and our transport teams who have worked on that in procurement, in pharmacy, in all sorts of areas. And we've been planning for capital investments to reduce our carbon footprint and do the right thing for the environment. And then in terms of digital, some of that capital that Steve mentioned has been spent on digital innovation. Um, so the molecular hub you're going to hear about in a minute. Um, but we also invested quite a lot in a radiology uh, shared imaging system. What this means is that if you have your X-ray or your CT or your MRI scan, in a Hampshire hospital's hospital, but then you get referred to Southampton because you need some specialist care and the doctors there need to be able to see what your scan said, they can now see it on the system. So we are able to share the reports, the images across the Hampshire Isle of Wight system, in fact beyond as well, Salisbury is also part of it. That makes a massive difference to patient care, it prevents duplication um, and it allows us to provide better care more cost effectively, but it was a massive project to get that online. And then we continue to work on having a fully digitalised medical record for all our patients. And part of that now is about scanning old paper notes. So the vast majority of new records that we create, new information we, we record, we do already record on the computer. And that's been a development over the last few years. 
but we do still have a lot of historic bits of paper that are really important in understanding people's care. And that's been um, the current project about how we scan all of those in so that they are accessible electronically to the clinicians who are providing care for the patient. That's a really important digital project. And then also under Innovating for a Sustainable Future is our new hospital programme. So Hampshire Together is the title of our programme, Modernising Our Hospitals and Health Services. And ever since the National New Hospital Programme was launched in 2019, we have been working with colleagues and partners to uh, work out what the very best option is around a new hospital for the people of Hampshire. And just to remind anyone that doesn't know, the money that is available for Hampshire is for a new hospital and for significant investment in the Royal Hampshire County Hospital in Winchester. So it's for both of those elements. And we've been working on plans, developing plans. It wasn't until May this year that we finally heard the actual amount of money that we have been allocated. And so having got that crucial bit of information, which will help us with all the challenges you see on the right here, um, we are now moving forward at pace and hope to be in public consultation on options within the next few months. Um, so really exciting and lots of progress and it's all full speed ahead now. The new hospital won't open probably until about 2032, but it takes that long to work out what you want to build, where you want to build it, get the planning permission, get the construction done and move everybody in. So it's brilliant that we're, that we're now foot to the floor to make that happen. So that's 22-23. In terms of the year we're in now, 23-24, we stick with our strategy and our strategic themes and our values. So we're still all about outstanding care for every patient, a great place to work for our people, working together for our population, the best use of our resources and innovating for a sustainable future. You've got on the left here a few of the key things. We have a series of improvement programmes that are about being uh, fit for the future financially, but also improving quality. Um, there's a real focus on reducing waiting lists and bringing down the times that people are waiting. We're still in a massive catch up post COVID. We can talk more about that in questions if that's helpful. We've obviously got our new hospital program and our digital strategy and the pro progress of that and absolutely about continuing to make Hampshire hospitals a great place to work. As I said, when we looked at staff survey results, we're not where we want to be yet. We haven't got absolutely everybody loving their job at Hampshire hospitals and we need to get there, but we are making great progress and it is an absolute focus for the senior team here at the hospital. So that was a whistle stop tour. I could have talked about a whole load of other things. So please do put any questions through the Q&A. And I think our comms colleagues are going to help try and group those with Steve as well so that we can answer any questions that you may have. Over to you, Steve. Alex, thanks. That was really, really helpful. So we have got a number of questions in the uh, Q&A and I'm going to go through them in the order that they were raised and attempt to pass them to the appropriate exec and um, who will then pass it on to the appropriate exec if I've got that wrong. So the first one is from Tanya. And I think, Ben, you might want to pick up on this. So this is how does the 28 day, the 28 day cancer target uh, in, the, in the UK compare to other European countries? Because from Tanya's perspective, four weeks seems quite a long, quite a long time of anxiety for people waiting for their uh, for their referral and for their results. So I don't know, Ben, is that something you could pick up on? Yeah, talk about that, Steve. Um, it, it, it varies across Europe. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, you're fine. Yeah, it varies across Europe. Um, some some countries um, have shorter um, length, lengths and, and, and some slightly longer. Uh, I think the, the UK in general at the moment is under pressure for cancer care uh, and, and we're not alone as a trust. Um, and coming out of COVID, uh, the number of referrals for, for cancer, suspected cancers have, have, have risen. Um, and like a lot of trusts in, in the country, we're putting on extra lists, putting on extra scans and putting on extra biopsies to try and catch. But there's a variation in various countries depending on their approach and, and, and their availability of resources. And it I is a long time, isn't it? And, and it, it, I, I, I recognise that and, and, and we do try to put in extra layers of communication with patients during that waiting time and, and keep our patients well informed as they go through the pathway. Yeah, and I think Ben, we've always tried to say, haven't we? Although uh, time to referral might slip a bit, 
it's the time to diagnosis, which is the absolute key, isn't it, for our patients? So thank you for that. There was a question then submitted just through to the comms team that said um, how industrial actions impacted on the delivery of services over the last 12 months. Andy Hyatt, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Steve. I think, you know, it, it most definitely has impacted. We've had to cancel uh, numerous uh, long waiting patients and patients waiting uh, for procedures and diagnostics. So interestingly, very high cancellation numbers when it came to the radiographers strike as well. So that is concerning us with another strike around the corner. Probably one of the big areas that's been uh, hit the most is outpatient activity and follow ups with numbers running into the hundreds at each different industrial action. I do have to uh, commend the teams though, the amount of planning that goes into our preparation for the strikes is massive. And we have been able to mitigate the impact. I'm, I'm gonna say it, probably better than some other organizations have. And as a result, actually the management of the, the strikes has been easier, but it is probably one of our biggest risks to uh, performance recovery this winter, because every time there is a strike, there is an impact. And of course, just to add, uh, Steve, that, that when we treat patients, it involves lots of professional groups. If one of those professional groups are on strike, the whole thing falls apart. So it's not like you can go ahead with your anaesthetist, but without your surgeon, for example. So big impact, and it's probably the biggest variable that worries me this winter. Thanks, Steve. OK, thanks, Andy. Really helpful. Uh, another question that's come through to the comms team. And Alex, you touched on this as part of your presentation, but how confident are you that the consultation of the new hospital programme will take place as planned? Well, only yesterday I was at a joint overview scrutiny committee going through the consultation plan and, you know, we got all of our ducks lined up. We have a series of meetings that we have to go through with national Treasury folk, with national NHS England folk. We think that they are all, you know, we've done everything they've asked us to do, but there is always a risk that you go to one of those meetings and somebody says, oh, well, actually, could you just go and do a bit more work on X, Y or Z? So until we've got through those formal sign off processes, I can't say 100 percent, but I'm feeling pretty pretty confident now that we've you know we've done everything they've asked um we've been around the loop several times um I can't believe there's more stuff they want to ask of us but I shouldn't say that because they probably will find something but yeah we are we are now in the countdown to the series of meetings that take us forward to consultation excellent thank you Alex um another question that was submitted to comms was how does our financial position compare to other foundation trusts Steve West So, I mean, I think it's fair to say last year um, our financial position relative to others was, was, was fairly poor. So we were probably one of the worst for our size. Um, we know there were some others in our system that were of a similar, um, similar, similar sort of order of magnitude of deficit. Um, the Isle of Wight clearly was was worse. They've got their own problems being an island. Um, I think this year, as I've said earlier, our position is likely to be relatively better. So we've started our recovery journey early. Um, and hopefully that means we'll come out of the other side of it um, as one of the first to come out of it. So I think that's that's where we are. I mean, I, I don't have the figures for every single trust, but I, I do know that we were one of the one of the worst proportionately last year. And, and Steve, would it be would it be uh, fair to say that if you were looking at this year's performance, financial performance year to date, notwithstanding that it's still a big deficit, how are we doing against our plan for this year? So, as you know, this year we set a, a deficit plan. We believed it was a realistic but challenging plan. We are currently on plan. So I think we are one of the few trusts in our system, in our region, who are on plan. Um, so clearly that's encouraging, but we've still got a significant deficit to deal with. So there's still a lot to do um, to get back to, 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 to financial balance, and we are working hard on that. Yeah. OK, good stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Tanya, I'm glad you asked this question because we did indeed uh, receive your questions in advance. I'm not sure we're going to be able to cover them all at the meeting here, but I'm, I, I did pass them on to Julie. So I'm going to let Julie respond to your specific question about how much we can cover tonight. But you can be absolutely clear 
that Julie will take those questions in a way and we will respond to you in detail about them. But it's a very good point you raise in there. And I just want to give Julie the opportunity to respond to the point you made in the uh, in the chat there. So Julie. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Tanya. And as Steve said, I will follow up after. So I think the general gist of your 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 email was the the avoidable waste, particularly where we've got duplication, where we correspond with patients both electronically and in paper, and the potential waste of you know a cost of printing and stamps, etc. And um, you're absolutely right, Tanya. And it is one of the areas that we are trying really hard to look at what we can do about that. So we've got, you know, a digital program that Alex talked about earlier on that is working towards making as much of that as electronic and paperless as possible. Um, at the same time, we've got an admin project going on, looking at how we can improve our admin processes and cut out some of this. Of course, in doing all that, we've got to make sure that those patients who don't have access to information electronically are also catered for. Um, but you know, there are a number of projects that are working at the moment to do exactly as you suggest there, which is to reduce the waste there. And then there was a third um, point in your question, and I've seen John Rummage on the uh, call as well. And I think this was this was one of the things that came up when we had our away afternoon, which was around the new build of AAU at Basingstoke that was originally built next to the ED department um, and at the moment has been taken over by ED. So just to explain to everybody, this was a purpose, it, absolutely right, it was a purpose built um, unit in COVID uh, because of our uh, you know the way we had to manage the infection control we had to t had to manage that area in a different way and also we it, the one of the benefits of doing that was it allowed us not to have people queuing in the corridor but to queue when there wasn't an appropriate space available in an appropriate area um, and in that process we moved our uh, assessment unit up onto f level um, we are aware that that's not that's not brilliant either it's quite a long way from ed and it is it is one of the things that we are continuing to discuss about how we can get it closer to the ED department, but at the same time, not, you know, manage our infection control and not go back to the days where we had patients queuing in the corridor. So it's an ongoing uh, conversation for us at the moment, Tanya, but very happy to follow up outside the meeting. OK, thanks, Julia. That's really helpful. Uh, Tanya also asked another question about how much HHFT have been allocated in funds to the new hospital. Alex, I think you can do this one, can't you? I can. So we were absolutely delighted to get in writing that we have been allocated between 700 and 900 million pounds. Now, the next question everyone asks is, well, what does that include? And does it account for inflation? And what's it worth in 2030? So there's lots of ins and outs. But but the net position is that's slightly more than we were originally expecting um, in real terms. So that is fantastic news. And as I say, that's both for a new hospital and some of that also will be invested in the Royal Hampshire County. OK, thank you. And then there's a question to comms here. Uh, what plans do the trust have to tackle current waiting lists? What levels are current waiting lists at? And Andy, that would be you again, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think I'll take that one. So um, the so what are we doing to, to tackle waiting times at the moment? Um, and loads is the honest answer. We're really focused on the long waiting patients. Um, we've done a, a lot of work. And in fact, uh, Ben and his team have been leading on it around theatre efficiencies, around diagnostic efficiencies and outpatients. And that's out how we will drive the improvements. Um, current performance is our um, RTT performance is at 53%. So are we where we want to be? No, the, the, the standard is still 18 weeks. Until we're back down to 18 weeks, I won't be happy and the board would expect me not to be. We've got about 55,000 as some patients on our PTL on the total waiting list, but we have made some really, really good headway. You know, uh, we're now re we're now reporting uh, last month. I'm just looking at my numbers. Five patients waiting over 78 weeks. All of those were complex pathways. Remembering that the pathway was never 100% of patients to be seen with 18 weeks. Um, we then start to look at how many patients we got over 65 weeks. And the next push is to have nobody waiting over 65 weeks by the end of March. We're on trajectory to deliver that. It's going to be a challenge. And um, we've currently got 956 patients waiting there. But we have seen improved theatre efficiencies. We've been seen improved outpatient performance and we're eating into that backlog of patients who've waited for a long time. The other bit I just want to mention, which is a, a, an, another bit of work that the divisions are doing, but really important, is making sure our capacity demand is aligned going forward. So not just let's clear the backlog, 
but also actually have we got the right capacity in our service to meet demands going forward? Steve, I hope I've answered the question. I think you have, but it was a bit of gobbledygook in there. So could you just unpack? I mean, we all know. Could you unpack PTL and RTT for people who may not understand? No problem. PTL is a patient tracking list, which to everybody else on the planning is a wait. Planet is a waiting list. So I do apologise. Um, I shouldn't have slipped into this tonight, should I? And RTT is referral to treatment. So the time from you being referred from your GP to receiving definitive treatment. And that's the really key bit, actually receiving the treatment you require. I hope, but NHS, I hope it didn't use as well, but I'll try and avoid any more acronyms. Apologies, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. Um, and actually, here's another chance for you to have another go then, because I think this one might be used as well, you as well. So how challenging is the trust expecting this winter to be? And are there, are there any worries around new COVID variants? And as Chief Ooh. Operating Officer, I think you're probably the right person to pick this up, aren't you? So as a chief operating officer, I always worry about winter, um, but they're getting more and more challenged. Uh, are me and myself and Julie watching anything with interest about infection variants going into this winter? Yes, we're watching very carefully the numbers and what's going on. And of course, we haven't got the strange testing regimes we've had in the past. So it's difficult to know exact numbers, isn't it, in the community? People on this call used to be testing like, uh, regularly, but we weren't going forward. Um, big worries this winter. So the number of patients in hospital, another term that I apologise without a criteria to reside before Steve stopped me. That's a national definition, but it is patients who no longer need to be in acute hospital, but more importantly, need to be somewhere else to be getting better. Um, that's one worry I have this winter. Obviously, you've mentioned the infection control numbers and the other thing is, in order to link back to the previous question, for us to clear out and improve our uh, elective performance, we've got to carry on doing elective all winter. There won't be a January, February, no electives while we focus. Of course, we'll always clinically prioritise the most important, and that's a challenge. Um, first part of the winter plan I've just signed off comes to board next week, and it will be a very dynamic document, and we'll complete work on it all the way through the winter. Um, I think it's my job to worry about winter when it comes down to it. Indeed, it is. Uh, off the top of your head, Andy, how many COVID patients have we got at the moment? Do you know? Oh, crikey, there's a number I don't know. Julie, can I do that bounce across to you? You might know that one. <laughs> 34. Thank you. 34. Well, I can do you no criteria to reside, no problem, Steve. <laughs> I, and the reason I asked you, Andy, was not to try and catch you out, but it was just to make people aware that COVID is still here. Yeah. It's still impacting on people and it's still making people ill enough to come into hospital. And that continues to put pressure on the system. So that was the reason I asked the question. Really? So yeah. um, there's a question here. And Julie, I don't know if you want to try and pick this one up. It's from Paula, which talks about whether the trust is taking any steps to attend deaf patients in British Sign Language. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we do have access to um, to support with sign language. But I have to say, Paula, we also recognise it's an area we could do a lot better. So we have ex we have experts outside that we can bring in. We have some of our own members of staff who can sign language. But I have to say, through our accessibility group and some of the work we go, we're doing around, um, you know, ac access to services, this is an area that we could do better on. And we recognise that. So it is it is an area of focus at the moment. OK, thank you, Julie. Um, so thank you for all those lovely questions. If uh, if there are any questions that come to mind as we go through the other presentations pertaining to this, then still put them in the chat and we'll organise them around that. And if we don't have time to pick them all up tonight, then we'll certainly take those offline. So, Alex, thank you for your presentation and Steve as well. Thank you for your questions. We're going to move on now and I'm going to invite to speak now Dawn Taylor, who is our lead governor. Dawn, over to you. So at the moment, Dawn, I think you're still on mute, but I'm not sure whether that's something you're controlling or we're controlling. So, Can you hear me OK now? Yeah, we've got you now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. OK. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our AGM tonight. It's been very interesting so far. Uh, my name is Dawn Taylor, and I am lead governor for the HSFT Trust and also a public governor for Northamptonshire and West Berkshire. 
and I also chair the Patient Experience Group Committee. Um, as you know, 2021 to 2023 has been a continued impact of COVID on all our lives. And I can't remember a time where the challenges of the operational, financial and performance pr pr pressure have been more intense. Yet staff at HSFT at all levels and each of the three locations have shown their professionalism and resilience when working through the most challenging of circumstances, often going over and above what is expected of them. The governors value our staff greatly, and we are continually humbled by the outstanding commitment demonstrated by every single member of the trust. And we take this opportunity, opportunity to send our sincerest thanks to all staff and volunteers for their commitment and dedication to the delivery of quality care they have shown. Despite local healthcare challenges, many of which the Trust still face, the Trust have continued to build on their try for improvements in quality, patient safety and experience, especially with the implementation of many new initiatives, Andover Community Diagnostic Centre, new equipment at both uh, Winchester and Basingstoke in pharmacy and biomedical sciences have given greater capability. New imaging equipment, new cath lab at Basingstoke, along with the newly built heart centre at Basingstoke, and now our new orthopaedic centre at Winchester will be dedicated to helping patients with orthopaedic health issues. The Council of Governors look forward to supporting the trust in progressing community models of care to ensure our patients are cared for at or as close to home and to further support the work with primary care and associated care providers in performing close collaboration and steadfast working practices for the benefit of both patients and their families. July 2022, was the start date for the integrated care system in Hampshire and the formation of the ICB and ICP, which will ensure all aspects of healthcare are considered and brought together like never before. So new horizons to look forward to. These have been challenging times for all of us and the NHS has been tested like never before in its history. That has been our experience here at HSFT, along with the rest of the United Kingdom. But we look positively forward to the future and greater opportunities. HSFT Council of Governors will continue to work tirelessly on both the public and staff behalf, and both the sporting trust to ensure that HSFT continues to provide the best in healthcare for Hampshire. And I wish to say, Thank you to all of our staff across both all units and especially our board and all of our staff from top to bottom, how we value your input and we cannot do without you. So please carry on the good work that you're doing. Thank you. Well done, Dawn, and thank you very much for that. Uh, let me just take this opportunity to say that our governors do a fantastic job. They come from a wide variety of backgrounds. They put a huge amount of effort into supporting the trust in many different ways but as governors of course as Alex said earlier they're volunteers and their contribution to make sure that we hear the voice of patients and we hear the voice of residents and specialist groups that they represent really does make a difference and and we underestimate sometimes and don't always see the contribution that governors make so on behalf of the trust board and and me personally Don thank you to you and all of your colleagues many many on the call tonight um, just for the thing, the, what you do for us, you just hold the mirror to us sometimes, and that that's so powerful and so helpful. So thank you for that. Okay, let's move on then to the uh, to the next presentation. So Louise Fox is going to talk to us about key achievements in nursing at HHFT. Louise, thank you, Steve. Can you hear me? Yep, great. 
Okay, um, so I'm one of the associate directors of nursing. I um, look after a, a broad portfolio, but quality and safety sits within in my remit. I'm going to give you a whistle stop tour of some of our areas of key focus. Um, as Alex mentioned earlier, there's a lot of nurses in the organisation. Um, we are the biggest professional workforce um, at the trust. Um, so we are we are here in force. So let me move to um, the first slide, which just shows you um, some of the areas that I'm going to talk about. And uh, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So mental mental health, um, it's a big agenda item for us at the moment. We have a um, newly appointed Associate Director of Mental Health, Autism and Learning Disabilities, who is Mark Morgan. Um, he's been tasked with devising our strategy for, for this group of patients and how we can best care for people who attend our services, building um, a strong team of experts to provide advice and education to our general nurses, both um, in the care of adults and also for children. The healthcare environment is changing. We've got more complex, longer stay patients accessing our services, and many of these have both physical and mental health needs. Um, we are a little behind the curve in terms of our skill set for mental health patients. Um, staff are currently being taught key strategies to care for, care for this group. Um, in a safe way. So things like de-escalation, um, distraction techniques, and also um, to be able to provide staff with a space to discuss these often challenging and sometimes distressing cases. Um, we're working closely with colleagues across the system. So multi-agency working is, is being seen at its best, where several providers um, across Hampshire and the Isle of Wight are coming together to support the care of, of a particular patient in one of our sites, but preventing that dilution of skills by us, us sharing our skills across those boundaries. Thank you. Next slide. Um, so patient experience um, and engagement. So there's a lot going on in this slide, as you can see, but our patient experience team are focusing on our quality priorities in a collaborative way um, so that our services and servants, service improvements are co-designed and co-delivered by both staff and patients. Training is in development and we are looking to engage people in quality improvement, so QI, as a learning framework for what we do. Key activities are ensuring that we are responsive and that we tackle health inequalities on the on the patch as we go. So a huge range of projects that are underway um, with patient and user involvement. So everything from the development of a visitor's charter to a complaints panel. Um, in February, we were joined by Helen Chandler, who's our first patient leader, and she's here to bring the voice of the patient to our improvements across the organisation. You'll see in the bottom left, there's a QR code, um, and that's for you to scan if you want to get involved um, and, and come and volunteer at the organisation. There's lots and lots of things for people to get involved with, and, and we want to hear your voice. Um, moving on to, to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so safe staffing and financial recovery, and obviously you've heard a bit about this from Steve and also um, from, from Alex in terms of our financial position. So safe staffing, um, we're required to report our daily staffing figures each month to um, NHS England. And it's important to recognise that when we use the, t the term safe staffing, it isn't merely about the number of nurses on duty, but it's also about their skills and their experience and how that balances out with the acuity and dependency of patients, um, which can change from hour to hour across the across the shift. Um, we reported green and amber levels of staffing over the last few months, and the position is mitigated throughout each day with the matrons redeploying staff where there's a greater need. Um, 
as you have heard from Alex, our registered nursing numbers are great. We've still got some work to do with the recruitment of healthcare support workers or healthcare assistants. Um, we have recently won a national award at silver level for the pastoral care of our healthcare support workers. And for this, we are so proud. It demonstrates the commitment of our teams in supporting these workers at the start of their careers with us, which will hopefully um, carry them through. Um, and we have um, access to a wide range of agency nurses. And I know that um, this has been spoken about a lot previously. They are great. They provide us with short term cover when we need it at short notice but they are costly and they don't offer us the consistency that substantive nursing staff do. Um, we are committed to eliminate agency nurses completely, so that will save money for the trust, but it will also strengthen our core teams. Um, and we will do this by continuing to, to recruit substantively to our wards. We'll talk a little bit more about this on, on the next slide. We have achieved this for general wards, so we're not using agency nurses um, on, on our adult um, medical and surgical wards, but we are still having to use um, pockets of agency nurses in specialties like paediatrics um, and the emergency department and also for, for mental health. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we've got lots going on um, to build careers. Um, Nursing, nursing recruitment is a challenge across the UK, but we are pleased to say that we're doing really well in attracting nurses to work for us um, with, with a, with a um, practically zero um, uh, vacancy rate for registered nurses. We've got currently 45 newly qualified nurses who are ready to start with us who've, who've just finished their courses and another 150 nurses for um, from overseas and they'll be starting between now and January and that seems like a lot for a vacancy position of, of zero but we do have people who leave for various reasons so we have a pipeline to, to keep us um, to keep us topped up. Um, we have been selected um, countrywide to su support a pilot programme with Nepal, and that's to recruit nurses. We've just started on that journey, but learning from this pilot will help shape uh, a nationwide programme moving forward. So it's an exciting time for us. We've got really close relationships with our universities um, and we are building programmes with them to support um, nursing education. So that's for both pre and post registration um, nurses. We've got different pathways to access nursing careers. So Alex has already talked about our apprenticeships, but we're also working closely with the Prince's Trust, um, with Project Choice, and also with the Department of Work and Pensions. So lots going on there. Next slide, please. This is a little bit about our ward accreditation program. So it's a trust wide audit program that we started in 2021 in the height of COVID. And we're happy to say we're now on, our, on its third cycle. Um, this program, it runs for eight months of the year. Um, and entails a review of data, so that's medical records, training stats, compliance documentation, rostering data amongst others. Um, and then an unannounced inspection. So that's similar to a CQC inspection where a team of people attend a ward, have a look at what's going on, talk to patients and, and talk to staff. And we collate all of this information uh, and the ward matron will receive um, a, a level or a standard. Um, and that is to base their improvements on. The programme is supported mostly by internal teams across the org organisation, as well as colleagues from other trusts. But most importantly, members of the public come and, and join our, our ward accreditation teams and, and come and give us their view of what they see and what they hear. Um, during COVID, we, we weren't able to have members of the public on the site, so they were introduced last year. They've brought with them a huge um, different perspective to us, which has been so helpful. Um, and we're hoping to develop this program um, year on year to make it the best that it can be. Um, the programmes resulted in huge improvements um, in ward standards and processes, and there's a keenness by the matrons and ward managers to go further to sustain their improvements, because it's probably the hardest, hardest thing for them. Um, next slide, please. 
So patient safety incidents response framework, it's a really long title, but we're calling it PSERV. This is a national change to the way that we manage incidents. And when I'm talking about incidents, I'm talking about a broad range of things um, like a, a delayed cancer diagnosis, for example, or a healthcare associated infection. And this is about a more collaborative approach um, with patient and family members involved in how we make improvements. Um, so this is a huge change for us. Um, we've got new patient liaison officers who um, are going to support family members and act as the, the point of contact um, and, and the liaison. We also have patient safety partners. So that's the lay perspective on our approach. They've already helped us build the framework um, for the trust to go live with this with this new response um, in October. Um, one of our partner trusts, so the Isle of Wight, was part of the pilot for, for this scheme. And we've been gleaning as much information as we can from them um, in order that we have a, a smooth transition. Um, it is going to be a challenging time, but we're hoping that it will mean better um, better collaboration with patients and, and families moving forward. So moving on to my last slide, I just wanted to mention the Care Improvement Programme. Um, we're calling Beyond Basics. So we've taken feedback from patients through all sorts of routes. So our inpa inpatient survey, ward accreditation, and also from matron ward rounds. And that's so that we can make improvements that matter to the people that we serve. So um, a couple of examples, Nighttime Standards um, is a project that's, that's running um, through one of the divisions and trust wide. Um, and this is about changing how we run our wards at nice nights. So really simple things like reducing noise from chatter and technology and bins and supporting a restful environment um, for patients who, who are ill or recovering. We've combined our combined our falls and tissue viability teams. So they're the people who, um, who look after skin um, to create the fundamentals of care team, they're working alongside junior nurses, focusing on skin integrity, nutrition, continence, mobility. We've seen a really positive response from our wards with junior nurses reporting feeling more confident in their early, early days with us. Um, they've also started an education of each of our care assistants in completing the care certificate. So that's a national qualification that underpins the expected standards for care assistants um, in a kind of roadmap um, so that they can they can follow a pathway and, uh, and achieve specific competencies. They've been successful in introducing this for all new starters to the organisation. They're now rolling out to, to those who have worked for us for some time. And then matron lunches are an opportunity for patients and family to meet with matrons to get them, uh, give them feedback on, on the care delivered. Um, we're making changes on how we maintain safety throughout a shift. So standardised approaches to sharing key information um, across the whole multidisciplinary team. So that's everyone from doctors to our admin support to our therapists um, with with key touch points within a shift so that everybody is clear on the priorities for for the next few hours. And then finally, this sounds really basic, but it's really important. We're making some changes to our information leaflets, so more robust information that people actually need. So better detail on visiting times um, and things like how to access a senior doctor or a matron and information on on discharge. So. I hope I've been able to give you a little insight into um, what we're doing with nursing at HHFT. It's only a very small piece of the pie, um, but thank you. Louise, that's fantastic. And I think what you've shown there is just the enormous amount of effort that goes on every single day by every single nurse in this organisation. It's fantastic stuff that you do. So well done. Um, I've got a couple of questions uh, around mental health. So. Uh, and perhaps you could have a go at both of these together. So Tanya's point, which is a very good point, about how much is invested in the system in general around prevention that stops people ending up in hospital with mental health issues and then just sl sliding on to and do Southern Health contribute to our mental health staffing in the trust? Do you want to have a bash at both of those? 
I think I'm going to hand over to Julie because I know that she'll have a lot to say about how he oh. Southern Health have been supporting us. All right, OK, go on then, Julie. OK, all right then. Um, so um, two questions, two, two answers. The first one is um, what we do know. It, so first of all, we work really, really closely together in partnership with Southern Health. What we do know is that there has been a really, really large increase in the demand on mental health services at all levels from primary care right the way up to tier, th tier three, four secure care. Um, and that we knew that there'd be a particular impact on community from COVID and we are starting to see it. So I think many of those services will report a 600% increase in some of the people being referred. Um, that said, there are a lot of things available to try and help people uh, maintain um, their mental health um, with uh, self-care. So things like uh, charities such as Mind, etc., right the way through to there has been investment in things like talking therapies. So in our area, that's known as IAPT. We've got investment into things like what's called early intervention and treatment. So trying to keep people in their own homes and helping them to manage their own mental health or with support there before they ever need to come into hospital. Um, in spite of that, we are seeing, um, as, as, as Louise said earlier on, a lot of complex patients now, not just with mental health, but with behavioural um, issues as well. In terms of the Southern Health part of our service, so Southern provide our liaison service. So those are particular services that look at patients in the first uh, 24, 48 hours, and they will make an assessment about their mental health needs, um, and they'll work closely with Southern Health about um, the a mental health act assessment and transferring them into appropriate other setting if that's required or home with support. We have our own mental health service, which is more for the ongoing, so where we've got patients that, particularly those that may be admitted um, with physical health needs and mental health needs, but and still need to be in hospital. So the, our team will do that. And then we we do have a partnership where, for example, if a patient comes over on what's called a Section 17 leave, so they're still under the Mental Health Act from the a Southern Health facility, but come over and need treatment, then um, the staffing will be either supplied by or supported by Southern Health. So we work, it's not a black and white answer, Tanya, it's very much a partnership of which uh, both of us have areas of responsibility in that. Great stuff, Julie. Um, and I suspect you might be best placed to pick up on Tanya's question about, uh, you know, a very reasonable question about if we're using Nepalese nursing, what impact does that have on the Nepalese health system? And I know we've talked about that as a trust, haven't we? So could you just yeah. tell us a bit more about that? Do you want to do that, Louise? Do you want me to do that? I'm happy to talk to it if you okay. Go on, Louise, yeah. Go on. So, so this is a pilot that's that's in collaboration with the Nepalese government. Um, we have to, you know, we have to be very mindful that we are bringing a lot of overseas nurses um, into the UK system, but a lot of countries. So, so first of all, there are red list countries that we're not allowed to recruit from, um, and that's where there there are economic difficulties with. Um, you, you know, with with migration, but a lot of these groups of nurses actually support their economies back home. So um, Filipinos um, and some of our African nurses will will come and work here. They build their lives here, but they send money back um, to support family members, putting them through college and school. The Nepalese project is is relatively small, and um, what would happen? Um, is that they would over overtrain, so overtrain for what they needed, so that they don't deplete their their workforce um, in their own country, um, and it's done very carefully and in a very measured way. So it's an absolutely um, valid question and one that comes up quite quite frequently, not just for the Nepalese um, staff, but also for from the other groups um, that that we recruit um, from. In, in some of the, uh, the, the developing countries. It's, it's probably just worth adding in, we're talking at the scale of about 10 nurses this year. Yeah. Not yeah, huge. Very helpful, Julie. Thank you. That helps to scale it. But yeah, it's a very good question, Tanya, and it's one that we've asked ourselves several times um, because there, you know, there's an, an, appropri an, an, uh, an appropriateness test to this, isn't there? So, And then Arlene's put a comment in there uh, about cancer support workers and how the, the trust has continued to fund them past their initial funding. But I think she's implying that that's not continuing equally across specialities. I don't know if anyone wants to pick that up, Julie. Is that something you might want to comment on? Sorry, I'm just reading it. Um, um, 
I'm, I'm not sure I can't. Do you mean um, we haven't got them in all cancer specialties, uh, Eileen? Yeah. Is that? I suspect that's what I mean. I tell you, no, I think we... the question, Julie, I think the question is around um, posts that have been um, provided by partnership um, uh, systems like Macmillan. Um, yeah. And the question is around um, the trust not funding them at the end of their contracts. So I, I'm not aware, Arlene, of any that we've not picked up the funding because one of the agreements with uh, places like Macmillan is that we will continue to support them at the end of their funding. That's one of the um, agreements we have to make in the first place when we accept the funding. So I'm not aware of any that haven't been continued. But if you're aware of any that I'm not aware of, then please let me know and I can look into that. But as yeah, far as I'm no. aware, everyone that's pumped primed has been picked up. Yeah, and Eileen says that's feedback that's come through the Cancer Service Partnership. So, I mean, Julie, if we could reach out to Eileen and just and just check that, that would be good. Um, and then uh, Mike's asked a question. What is the impact of the integrated care system, Hampshire and Ottawa, on patients in mid and North Hampshire? Um, and I suspect, Alex, that's a three and a half hour answer, isn't it? Because there are a whole many, many different aspects to that. But did you want us to give up the the one minute version to that answer. <laughs> Not the three and a half hour one then, no. Um, and it's lovely to see you again, Mike. So good of you to come along this evening. Um, so the um, the impact of the um, system on patients. So I guess it, it covers a wide range of things. So one of the things the the systems are set up to do is to share best practice that um, from one trust into another to support collaboration across trusts across um, between trusts and GPs and uh, community settings. So I'm just trying to think of a, a couple of examples. So we um, have been working on waiting list improvements with some of the colleagues down at Southampton um, and collaborating together on um, we ran some uh, super Sundays and super Saturdays around urology in order to get um, some urology patients treated really quickly working collaboratively with partners that would be a specific example we have examples in um, radiotherapy where um, UHS run our radiotherapy service up in Basingstoke. Um, we have examples around getting patients home quickly, um, including a couple of um, very complex mental health patients we had with us last year where we work collaboratively across the system to support them moving on to a, a better setting, um, as well as the more general kind of elderly patients and trying to support them going home. I mean, there are lots and lots of things. This is effectively us working with our partners um, yeah. and the integrated care system just makes that um, easier, maybe. But we were always doing some of it, so it's not all brand yeah, new. And and Alex, I think the development of the elective hub in Winchester, which yeah. is, is co-development with that, there's all sorts of examples yeah. of that. And we mustn't forget that, of course, it's the OACB that are running the consultation on the new hospital as well, of course, with our support. Um, Louise, one quick question before we move on, and this might be what I can or cannot see on my screen. You mentioned a QR code um, in your presentation about how people could get involved, and I don't think I could see it on the bottom left-hand corner of my screen. And that may be the screen I was looking at. Um, can we just check that if people could or couldn't see that and how they can get access to it if they need it? Yep, we'll yeah. do that. I'll do that Brilliant. with Will. OK, thank you very much, Louise. Brilliant presentation as always. And thank you for the questions. Let's move on. So uh, Stephen Kidd's next principal clinical scientist for the Trust, um, and he's going to talk about microbiology and pathology support for patient care. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invite to be here. Um, as well as being a clinical scientist in microbiology, I'm also the lead scientist for the Trust. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about healthcare science in general, um, some of the work we've done nationally, and then also some really interesting innovations we're leading um, and led to, has led to our research innovation hub down in Manche uh, Manchester, down in uh, Winchester even. OK, next slide, please. OK, just um, so, some good stats. A lot of people often don't always think about scientists in the NHS. Um, often they're in the basement of a lot of uh, hospitals because often the things they do are smelly, so they like to be kept away from everybody. Um, so just just a, a, a kind of a brief overview of healthcare science within the NHS. There's over 50 different specialties in healthcare science. And there's over 50,000 healthcare scientists within the NHS. Um, and a nice little stat that uh, sometimes I think gets forgotten about that 
over 80 percent of diagnosis in the hospital has been underpinned by laboratory investigations and diagnostics so it's a really cre critical part of the of the patient pathway and we're always looking to improve it and try and um, ensure that we are using the best methods and the most innovative ways of working uh, next slide please so as we I kind of look to the future. Um, one thing that we're being challenged is, is everything we're doing based on the best evidence. So we really want to kind of improve the way we work using evidence based medicine approach as ensuring and reviewing everything we do is is based on the most up to date and evolving evidence. And it's something that we it's, it's obviously been reflected in, in COVID, the pandemic, that knowledge changes and there's nothing wrong with changing your mind and understanding changes with uh, new evidence is presented. So we want to ensure that we're always uh, kind of horizon scanning some the latest evidence around all diagnostics. Um, and it's something that we're really looking to improve what we do and has led to the um, uh, the research and innovation hub in, in Winchester coming about. Uh, next slide, please. So everyone's familiar with diagnostic pathways um, and so what we like to do is that we like to split them up because we like to think that if we could improve every little aspect of pathways, um, then we can kind of um, incrementally improve everything. So it's like the the one percent rule. If we can improve loads of things one percent, then we'll we'll um, have an easier way to change and um, have meaningful change that's hopefully not too disruptive. So this can be right from the what's known as the pre-analytical stages, which is everything from the patient engagement, the correct samples are taken, are the samples taken in the correct way, have we ordered the right samples, um, have we sent them to the laboratory at the right time. These are always consultations we're doing with our clinical teams um, and laboratory teams to ensure that those pathways are really smooth. Um, so even something as simple as getting samples transported um, to the lab in a meaningful time has a big impact on, on that patient um, and, and the patient pathway. And then obviously we want to ensure that the, the lab tests we're doing are the best we can, the, the correct ones, and then we're reporting a really a correct result because, you know, every time we take a, a sample from a patient, you know, that is um, potentially an invasive um, sample taking procedure. Um, we've got to ensure that people recognise that samples are important, they're precious, that they're, they've come from the patient and patients sometimes would be uncomfortable to, um, giving those uh, samples. So we've got to ensure that they're treated with respect, they're treated with um, and given the best chance to give a good result back to that patient to optimise their patient care. And then the last part is the post, what's known as the post analytical part. It's it's have we got the right results? Have we reported the results? in to the right teams have they been report has it been reported in a way that is understandable and that actually um can um, be acted upon in a timely fashion to improve um patient care so we're constantly looking and, and trying to improve in pathology and in this pathway and it will engage lots of different teams um and stakeholders to improve every part of that process so I think we're, one of the projects that's really gaining momentum is around uh, sepsis and improving that pathway all around the NHS. It's often quite a uh, uh, kind of a headline grabbing um, um, in, the, in the national press around sepsis and sepsis deaths. And so it's a real national priority to improve that. And we're something we're looking at HFT to just improve that pathway using uh, this kind of pipeline around what's known as collecting blood cultures and ensuring they're done timely and, and we're doing a lot of work around that which I'll get to very briefly. Um, next slide please. So um, one of the most important things that we, we do in pathology is if we ever need to improve something are we uh, addressing an unmet clinical need? Um, I mean as Steve briefly mentioned earlier that you know finances are tight in the NHS so anything we do we want to have maximal benefit for the the best value for money and can we deliver it in a timely fashion impactful fashion so there's something we're always constantly reviewing every time we bring in anything new or reviewing any optimizations within any of our testing uh, modalities um, that unmet clinical need and next slide please 
Um, this is just a very brief slide. It looks a bit busy, but this is just an example of um, how we can make an impactful um, position around improving the diagnostics around blood cultures and sepsis patients with bloodstream infections that can lead to sepsis. Um, this is uh, part of a national program that we're part of um, that's come out of the um, Chief Scientific Officer for England, Professor Dame Sue Hill. She has four national priorities and one of them is the blood cultures and sepsis. Um, and essentially um, by using improved pathways and novel diagnostics, we can reduce that time of what's known as diagnostic uncertainty when we don't know what's potentially wrong with the patient. Can we use better information faster to improve uh, and give optimal um, therapy in a much more uh, concentrated, shorter time? So a lot of the things we're looking at is reducing um, that time to which we can get some personalised medicine approaches. Um, and this does fit in with the, the four P's of personalised medicine, which we're looking at. Um, you know, personalised and preventative disease diagnostics. We're looking at a lot of things like prognostic indicators to try and predict if people will become ill and are well in a better way. Um, more precise diagnostics, better diagnostics, kind of then targeted personalised interventions, but also using uh, more of a participatory role with patients as well. So this is, you know, personalised medicine is, is quite a buzzword. It's coming and this is the type of things that will feed into that. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think this is really just a, kind of a summary slide to what what we've been doing and what we're looking at. That um, improving diagnostics is just not not just about getting better lab tests. It's a very holistic approach from the end of the beginning of the patient pathway to the end and all the stakeholders involved, and whether that's in the community or the clinical teams on the ground or our partners within um, Wessex and, and the greater community in the NHS. Um, next slide, please. So one one thing that we've uh, managed to do well, um, HFT, which is kind of giving us a bit of momentum to create this research and innovation hub, was a, a good proven track record of um, using novel ways to improve um, care for patients within and without outside of the hospital. So I've just there's a very brief story um, that's really nice. I know it was a few years ago now, um, but it's just it's kind of a number of the team in, in pathology and microbiology um, elsewhere in the trusts um, are lucky enough to have worked nationally on a number of national committees around improving different patient pathways and infection, particularly. Um, this is one of them. So this was a time, if you remember, if everyone can still remember, the beginning of COVID, it seems like such a long time ago. Um, but there was a time when um, patients in care homes weren't getting uh, tested for testing for COVID um, at all. And it was a real gap in, in, in the national testing programme in the summer of 2020. So one thing that we thought about doing was we, we thought we want to work with our community partners to improve that part. And so we thought, why don't we design a lab in a van to go out to communities to um, to go and test them. And then we work with our public health consultants in, in, in the local area, the health protection units, and put together a strategy. We went to the cabinet office, asked for some money, and they said, yes, absolutely, go ahead. Um, and this was the result, um, uh, microbiology on the move, lab in motion. So this was known as Vandemic. Um, and um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, as you can see, this was a this is inside the van. This was completely designed by us, and then we worked with a fabrication company to create this. And then um, we did a, a four week pilot where we worked with public health to target outbreaks in healthcare in the healthcare communities, particularly in care homes and um, adult centres with learning difficulties who were really seemed to be dropping off the testing radar um, because they weren't elderly. And, and they weren't children. So that was a real niche group that needed looking after. And this is before any national testing was done. Um, next slide, please. So this was us on, on the ground um, in, in the care home in Andover. Um, there was some inclement weather, so we had to set up some tenting and we, we tested the whole care home in an afternoon um, and picked up a number of positive cases. They would not have been able to have tested. There was zero testing available at the time. Next slide, please. Um, and as a result, I went to 10 Downing Street to present the work to Boris and Chums um, back in 
the end of uh, round about beginning of 21. Um, they're really impressed with this. And it was also obviously probably worth noting, we were also using some of the testing that we developed, the rapid 15 minute test that we developed on saliva um, was also in, deployed in that. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and as a result, the, the government commissioned 40 new pandemics, um, which we used throughout the rest of the pandemic response and which were manned by the army initially. So we hosted scientists from the army, um, from the Navy and the RAF. And here's them just outside Basing State where we were training them how to operate. So these would be what was, these was known as the Tiger Team. The Tiger Team would then go out and train up the national fleet. Um, next slide, please. Um, and yes, yeah, so they, as you can see in the top right hand corner, there was a the 40 of these that went around um, doing emergency outbreak testing for the next two years of the pandemic based on on the model that we we'd um, piloted at HFT. Um, and alongside that, with a, a um, asymptomatic staff program in the NHS that we helped to lead on um, around 17 trusts in in the NHS England. Um, and in the end, there was over 2.3 million staff tests done, pulling out over 62,000 NHS staff from their um, ward-based jobs to prevent them from spreading disease further. Um, and and we also um, uh, managed to, and we were working daily with these throughout the pandemic. So this was a, just a bit of a kind of a, uh, something that we've done and when it's leading on to some more work that we've done and some real national recognition um, Next slide, please. Um, so this led to the creation of an actual home for some of this work. So a lot of this work was in pathology, where it, if anyone's been down to the labs, they're quite crowded, so forth, they're quite smelly. There was no real space to do some of this work. So um, earlier in the year, um, the Molecular Diagnostics Hub um, opened in the basement in Winchester. Basement again, but at least there was some plenty of space. Um, uh, and Alex and, and and various VIPs came to for a tour, um, and um, uh, we've got some interesting projects and collaborations coming uh, to augment and uh, work alongside R and D and the trust and pathology. Uh, next slide, please. So um, there are a number of projects running um, around sepsis, improving diagnostics. Um, we are working with a number of academic partners um, in the area of the University of Southampton, University of Reading, where we've got a number of National Institute for Health Research grants around improving the UTI diagnostic pathway. Um, we're working with the Wessex Academic Health Science Network on, and we're a clinical partner for a new startup on rapid um, antimicrobial susceptibility testing for sepsis. Um, and we're looking to uh, partner with the University of Winchester um, on some interesting research projects. Um, and then also we're getting a lot of interest from um, commercial companies where they would like some help getting their rapid testing to market. And because we've got experience of this, um, we have a commercial arm which can work with these companies to get their um, assays and tests through the regulatory authorities. Um, um, and I think that basically sums it up. It's been a really it's a really exciting time to be in in science in healthcare science clinical science and diagnostics um and i think one thing to be said that um one of the outputs from the pandemic is that there's a real awareness that has been raised around the impact of science in, in healthcare um and how this is now being um the funding's being boosted to ensure that we can continue the momentum because it really showed the impact of, of diagnostics in, in the pandemic and just going very back to very briefly to to COVID, um, we are keeping an eye on COVID. There is a new variant that is is spreading from the US. But one of the things we do have that we didn't have before is in the in the, we have a surveillance system in place in Winchester that gives us more rapid surveillance of COVID in our area than the national teams can do. So we sequence um, all samples from patients within HFT to give. Um, the IPC teams, the most up to date information on what's spreading and what's around, which is what something we didn't have during the pandemic. And it's a developed tool we've developed um, and it's been really successful. Uh, thanks very much. Brilliant stuff, Stephen. As always, I never cease to be amazed about the 
uh, just the stuff that goes on beyond the covers and, and talk about unsung heroes. So, uh, yeah, well done to you and your team. The van is just a really good example of initiative and sights and action, wasn't it? And um, Tanya's made quite a long comment there in the in the that you'll see from the question. I'll let you have a look or read through that. I think it's more of a comment than a question. And also Mike has just picked up in his comment about um just the work that you've um that you've done. Uh, Nicholas asked a question about um has all this innovation at HSFT helped with recruitment into healthcare science? There, there has there's, there's um yes and no. Um, I think with every specialty in the NHS, there is a bit of a, um, there are gaps. Um, I think that's more of a national problem than particularly a local problem. I certainly feel that we we do have people coming to work at HFT because they've seen a lot of the work that gets that has been done. So that's, that's yeah. nice. Um, and we are providing opportunities and would like to work with the University of Winchester um, when hopefully they have a, a, a biomedical science um, degree potentially coming online, which will be involved in, in in hosting students and maybe pathology staff providing lecturers, et cetera. Um, so, so yes, yeah. Okay, and Tony's asked a question about um, could this excellent and outstanding rapid diagnostics project be broadened to cover other potentially fatally diseases such as meningitis, typhus, fever, malaria? Uh, yes, all infectious diseases. Yeah, we, we, we that's, Sepsis is a, is a headliner, but we've done a lot of work and are working with a number of new startups around bacterial meningitis, particularly that can really affect adolescents. Um, so yes, is that answer? And and malaria as well. We do still see a bit of malaria around in Basing Stake and Winchester. Obviously, they brought it back with them. It's not around that area, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Scientists, when scientists say stuff, Stephen, people listen. All right. So yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, very yeah. I don't want to see a headline of malaria. I'm very happy to see that. Okay, I'm very aware of time, and we've got one more presentation to go. Can I just remind people if you want to ask a question, it's not possible to put your hand up in teams the way we've configured it. So please type your question in the Q and A section. So thank you for that, Stephen. Brilliant stuff. Well done, uh, and well done to uni teams as well, because it's I don't it, there's a stat in there that's not lost on me about. 80% of healthcare is underpinned by the work that scientists do. So brilliant stuff. Thank you. Let's move on then to our final presenters, Sam Jackson and Becky, uh, Becky Housley. And they are going to talk about empowering patients through virtual care and talk about our virtual health. Sam and Becky. Thank you, Steve. Um, so my name is Becky Housley and I am the consultant nurse overseeing the Virtual Health Hub at Hampshire Hospitals. And Sam, I'll just let you introduce yourself and your title as well. Yeah, hi, I'm Sam Jackson. I'm a physio by background and I'm the clinical service lead for Virtual Health at HHFT. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So I thought I'd just um, give you an oversight really of what the Virtual Health Hub at Hampshire Hospitals is and it's a really really exciting place to work and I absolutely love my job so um, credit to HHFT because it's a fantastic place for me to work. So the Virtual Health Hub consists of three services and it's a non-medically led service and what I mean by that is that it's not run by doctors, it's run by highly specialist um, nurses, physios and actually we have a pharmacist within our team. So, and what we want to do and what the aim of the Virtual Health Hub is to ensure that we provide safe and effective care for patients in what they call home. So no one wants to be in hospital where, where they can be, so ultimately we want to try and provide safe care for patients at home. So the first service that we support is our telemedicine service, and this is to support um, patients or residents in their care homes um, across Hampshire. And we will support with clinical advice and treatment for the patients. So carers and nurses will ring us up like they would normally ring a GP up, but we encourage them now to ring our telemedicine service. And we will support with a remote consultation for that resident. Within our team, we have four prescribers, so we can do remote um, prescribing, so we can um, treat patients virtually and hopefully then keep them safely at home. These, um, the telemedicine service covers actually a really large area. It covers the mid, north and southwest of Hampshire. And the homes we cover are residential, nursing and learning disabilities. But we also support with um, South Central Ambulance Services as well. So if they turn up to a residential or nursing home, they can also ring us for advice and we can hopefully support with that patient to keep them safe at home. 
If we're concerned about a patient, we have access to our colleagues within Southern Health and we can ask for a face to face visit so we can ensure that patients are safely managed. So if we are concerned and we need someone to actually go and review a patient, we have easy access either through our community colleagues or also GPs or South Central Ambulance, like I said. So that's our telemedicine service. It's a really busy service and I'll explain a little bit more about that in the next slide. The next service that we support with is our virtual wards and we currently offer eight specialist virtual wards um, within HHFT or Hampshire hospitals. And what we want to do with our virtual wards is support patients at home and we can remotely monitor them um, to keep them safe. And the idea is that we want to support with early supported discharges where possible. So no one wants to stay in hospital. And if everyone can, if patients can get home sooner, then that's a be better thing and a better outcome for patients. But we also want to support with emission avoidance as well. So people that are at risk of coming into hospital, what can we do differently? And can we support them in their homes through remote monitoring? So we have lots of pathways to support our virtuals. GPs can refer to us for patients who are at risk of coming into hospital and likewise so can South Central Ambulance Service or the ambulance crews. But also the hospital teams will refer to us directly to support with patients getting home sooner. So some of the main um, virtual wards, and I won't go through all of them, but some of the main ones that we support with, and our, probably our busiest one is our frailty virtual ward. And we probably manage about 40 patients on average at one time on that frailty virtual ward. We also have an acute respiratory infection virtual ward, which always gets really busy over the winter periods, which also supports COVID infections as well. And we also have a respiratory virtual wards for patients with long term conditions that are high risk of admission and to also support them getting home sooner. We have a diagnostic virtual ward and that's the support with patients that might be waiting for some tests while they're an inpatient in hospital. They may be waiting for blood results. They may be waiting for X-rays. They also may be waiting for CT scans, etc. And what we want to do is if patients can go home sooner, we can follow them up with those results, speak to the specialist teams if necessary and ensure patients get followed up in the, the same way they would have done as an inpatient. This service covers obviously just the mid and north Hampshire. And our last service, and this is the service that's ex most exciting to me, and this is what gels all of our services together, and it's the Clinical Communication Centre. And what that is, is a single point of access into secondary care to support our colleagues in the community. So whether that's our GP, ambulance crews, community practitioners within Southern Health, whether that's urgent community response teams that see patients within their own homes within Southern Health. But what we want to do is ensure that patients get reviewed in the right place at the right time and by the right clinician. So GPs can phone us up, we will support with the medical take and we can then directly admit patients to hospital um, therefore in um, reducing the time for GPs to spend speaking to um, a doctor at the uh, hospital. Um, so obviously lots of people can um, ring us to support with that service. We can also access um, our same day emergency centre, for instance, where patients might be seen in the same day and then discharged home. But ultimately, we want to make sure patients are seen in the right place, avoiding ED where we can or emergency departments. And if that's um, the best place, then ultimately we will also support with them going to the emergency department. But what you can see, the clinical communication centre gels all of our services together. So if a patient deteriorates in our telemedicine service, we have access to admit them into the hospital through the clinical communication centre. And likewise, with our virtual wars, we have access to support bringing patients into hospital if we need to. Um, this service covers the Mid and North Hampshire. Can I have the next slide, please? So just a few figures before I hand over to Sam, because Sam's going to talk through some of the ambulance um, service work that we're supporting with at the moment. But just a few figures. So our virtual wards, as you can see, actually with our frailty virtual ward or patients over the age of 65, we're now seeing a three day um, reduction in their length of stay in hospital. And that's got to be a bad, you know, good thing for patients. No one need, wants to stay in hospital any longer. 84% um, of our patients said they feel much more confident to go home with our virtual ward support. So we will follow them up daily or sometimes every other day to ensure that they're remaining safe and um, to stay at home. Our telemedicine service, we've now seen a reduction of 726 ambulance conveyances to care homes through supporting our um, patients in residential and nursing um, and the learning disability homes. And 
across Hampshire, actually we cover, I think it's about 260 care homes across Hampshire. So we actually a really, really busy service for our telemedicine team. We imagine probably about 500 consultations a month um, and it actually equates to 8,000 beds. If you actually added up all the beds in all the care homes, that's the amount of um, beds we're covering. So it's a really, really busy service. And finally, so since we opened at the beginning of um, 2020, we've now managed over 26,000 consultations through the Clinical Communication Centre. So it's a really busy service, but what I love about the job, it adds variety and our team all really enjoy working within our service because it's it's so varied um, within its own right. So Sam, I'm just going to hand over to you and I know you want to just focus on some of the work we're doing with the ambulance service as yeah, part super. of the Clinical Communication Centre. Thank you, Becky. Centre. So yeah, so Alex sort of briefly uh, made a nod to this earlier. So this is looking at a project that we've uh, been running and is now sort of business as usual within virtual health called uh, Call Before Convey, which um, actually the team uh, came second place in a health and safety journal um, awards up in Manchester. So we, um, the team had a, a nice jolly up in Manchester, which I think was well deserved for all the hard work that's been put in over the last nine months to get this up and running. But the idea really is as Becky said, making sure that patients receive the right care in the right place, whether that's in hospital, at home, being supported face to face in the community, whether that's a district nurse follow up, whether that's being referred into the voluntary services. And it's clear to say, it's clear from this um, that this is not an HHFT thing. This is a multi organisational across all of the patch involving all sectors that sort of that, that delve into healthcare to ensure that people are receiving the, the right care. And I can see a few of our colleagues from from um, South Central Ambulance and Southern on the on the call, and this is this is definitely not us. None of this works without all of the dots of healthcare being there for us to be able to join them up. If we move to the next slide, please. So, the key thing with any service that you're delivering is that you are safe. And we've run lots of pilots of this. So we ran three pilots uh, at the back end of last year to trial paramedics calling in before they look to convey a patient in, into hospital. So previously a paramedic would have gone out to see somebody, made a clinical decision and then transferred them into hospital. But the idea was they call us before they transfer somebody into hospital and uh, sort of as a, a team with knowledge of how the hospital runs and what services are out there in a the community, can we try and find an alternative pathway for that patient to receive their urgent care need wherever that, that may be? The pilots showed we're incredibly safe and effective. We caused no harm. There were no un unexpected readmissions back into hospital from what we did, and there were no patient deaths. So it was, it, it, it was, it was safe is the key thing. And then it also started to show that clearly we are making a difference in the emergency department. So we uh, sort of had a reduction of 10% of paramedics that called us, and between 10 and 15% weren't escalated into hospital. Somewhere in the region of 15 to 16% of patients were seen in an ambulatory care setting instead of needing to come in. 30% of patients were admitted directly to a speciality, whether that's medicine, surgery, cardiology or whatever it would be. But there was still clearly a proportion of patients that rightly needed to go to the emergency department. But we at least had the heads up that people were coming in and we could give the emergency department an idea of who is coming in at what time scale they're coming in. And it just gives the ability for the a very busy department to try and use their resource to be able to manage that. Um, next slide, please. So. We've made a big impact on paramedics or ambulances bringing patients into hospital. So you can see from this, um, from the stats here, over the last year, Basingstoke and Winchester have seen a great, uh, a much less increase in paramedics coming into um, coming into the emergency department. And a really nice story that sits behind this. Actually, I, I, we received a call last week from the paramedics who'd been out to see a lady in her late 80s who had been into the emergency department the day before and broken her arm. She was assessed in the emergency department and uh, when she was in the emergency department her mobility was good she was able to look after herself was able to make a hot drink and was safe to go home she was sent home and clearly uh, when you get into your own home that you're walking on carpet not a hard um, not a hard hospital floor your kitchen is further away you're not taken down in a wheelchair down into your kitchen and life can at times be harder and she wasn't coping as well as she thought she would do her son called 999 the paramedics came out to see her and they rang us we had a discussion, so I had a discussion on loudspeaker with the paramedic, with the son and with the patient. And um, in a really short period of time, we were able to speak to Hampshire County Council, who were able to increase her care as of starting the next day. We spoke to our colleagues at Southern Health in the urgent community response team. They were able to get a, a physiotherapist to go out and see her and do a clinical and physical review of her the following day. 
this was at about two o'clock in the afternoon so we put her on our virtual ward the son was going to do her care overnight and support um support his mother and we ensured that we called him three times to make sure that he was feeling comfortable with what he was doing he felt safe and he felt well supported and at any point he could ring us if he didn't feel it was safe he didn't know sort of he didn't feel comfortable with what was going on and neither did his mum we would have brought him straight into hospital she stayed at home overnight the care uh, care team went out the urgent community response team went out they realized actually she wasn't as safe as she could be at home and they moved her up into Alton Community Hospital to receive rehab and actually so she's gone from home straight to a rehab environment instead of coming into an emergency department going to a medical ward then moving into a rehab de department and all of the challenges that come with uh, an increased length of stay so it's a really lovely service that works really hard and it is very difficult to keep people out of hospital at time but we're in a really fortunate position where through the sort of the, the links that we have and the work we've done, we're able to integrate with all of these different services to try and coordinate care as best we can to keep people at home. Next slide, please. So this is a really a small slide and I know we're coming to the end and sort of statistics are deathly boring at times, aren't they? But I think these sort of tell a really lovely picture of some of the work that we're doing, but also some of the work that our other organisations are doing to sort of to help our emergency department and then this links in really well with the integrated care board that the question that Alex was answering in the integrated care system that Alex was answering earlier. So what we can see here is the amount of conveyances of ambulances into the emergency departments in the top left at HHFT, top right the Isle of Wight, bottom left Portsmouth and the bottom right is um, the University of Southampton. So that goes back to my statistics earlier. We are seeing over a year less ambulances, a, 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 a smaller increase in ambulances coming into our emergency department. Now, Becky and I won't claim credit for all of that, but we've put in a lot of hard work and it is no doubt making a difference. If we move on to the next slide. So something that's really important, and this um, this is uh, this is lost to hand over time. So what this is is a really important marker for paramedics of how long it takes to hand over your patient in the emergency department. And the quicker you can hand somebody over, the quicker you can get back out onto the road and be helping patients that need urgent care. So again, top left is HHFT, and this is just this calendar year. So you can see a massive drop off compared to the other organisations in loss to handover times. So because less paramedics are coming in, they are coming in expected and they're going to different departments. It's reducing the amount of time that paramedics are spending in the department waiting to hand their patients over. And linking into the integrated care system, this data is shared via the integrated care system. And we've already had the Royal Berkshire, Portsmouth and Southampton come to visit the department because they're really keen to see the work that we are doing. And that is because information is shared via the integrated care system. So we want to share this around. We want that graph to be exactly the same for every single organisation in the area. We don't want to be uh, the lead is whilst everybody else is struggling. We need to share this information to make sure we are all doing best practice. And it's fabulous having other hospitals come in to see what we're doing, to make suggestions, to see what they're doing well in their areas as well, to see how we can improve. But yeah, uh, thank you everybody for listening. So, Becky, thank you very much indeed. Um, those stats are very telling, aren't they? Um, and I think just these examples you give of services we could put in place that just make it better for patients. That's the thing that cries through all of this, isn't it? It's just a, just a, a, a better experience for people, especially those frail and elderly people that you talked about, Sam, as well. So um, a few questions um, in the uh, Q&A. If a patient cannot gain, gain a same day uh, GP appointment, can they access the virtual health hub by calling 111? They can indeed. So if you speak to a clinician in 111, they uh, have access to call us to discuss what they, um, if they if they feel that patient could be um, supported outside of hospital or they feel they want the patient to come into hospital or they want to speak to one of the medical consultants or surgical consultants through calling that clinician that they speak to will call us and we can we, we can do that as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so you're going to get told off a little bit here. I think it might have been you, Becky, actually, about what a, is a take or a take list. Sorry, that, that's my my fault. So it's essentially um, when patients are admitted to hospital, they may be admitted under a certain speciality. Um, so medicine, as an example, or surgery, and they will have a list every day of patients that they are expecting into the hospital and they call it a take list. So, yeah, apologies. That it probably no worries, no worries, so yeah, it's a list so they know who's coming into hospital. 
Brilliant, thank you. And I think you might have covered Dawn's question off by a later part of your presentation, which was about can a family member access the virtual health help on behalf of the patient? So you can't directly can... refer yourself in as a patient, but if you're on a virtual ward and a, a carer or a relative is concerned yeah. about you, then they are very, very welcome to call us. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well done. Thank you. Um, yeah, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for that as well. And can I just say to those colleagues from Southern and Scazza on the call, thank you for your contribution to that as well. More and more we see examples of organisations working much more effectively together and it is to the benefit of patients, which after all is why we all do the jobs that we do, isn't it? So thank you. Um, so we've come to the end of the AGM. Um, can I just say thank you to you all for joining us today? I hope you found that um, interesting and helpful. Can I say thank you to all the presenters? Um, inspirational stuff, all of you, all the presenters had something in there, didn't they? About the brilliant work that we do. Can I say thank you to the comms team at Hampshire Hospitals for creating this event. I think this is one of the best AGMs we've done actually in the way that it's been organised and run. You've done a great job. So thank you to you as well. And then finally, I'll finish off again by reiterating what I said at the beginning of the um, evening. Thank you to all our staff. You are fantastic. And without you, we are nothing. Thanks everyone. And I hope you enjoyed the, the day. <laughs>